Senator Marcus Davis was known for his dedication to the people, especially those from underprivileged communities. Despite his powerful position, Marcus preferred to keep a low profile when visiting neighborhoods that politicians often overlooked. On this particular evening, he decided to drive himself to a local community center that he had been quietly supporting for years. Wearing casual clothes and driving an old car, he knew no one would recognize him without the fanfare of his political entourage. The streets were quiet as Marcus navigated through the dimly lit neighborhood, his mind focused on the issues facing the residents. He had intentionally left his security detail behind, wanting to blend in with the community and listen to their concerns without the distraction of his political status. Little did he know, his attempt to remain anonymous was about to backfire in the worst way possible. As Marcus pulled to a stop at a red light, he noticed a police cruiser tailing him closely. The lights flashed, and the familiar sound of a siren pierced the night air. Marcus frowned, confused. He wasn't speeding, nor had he broken any traffic laws. Still, he pulled over to the side of the road, rolling down his window to comply with what he assumed would be a routine stop. The officer, a stocky white man in his 40s with a face hardened by years of unchecked authority, approached Marcus's car with a flashlight in hand. Without greeting, the officer barked, License and registration. Marcus complied, his mind racing through the possibilities of what could have triggered the stop. The officer's cold demeanor, however, hinted that this was not going to be a standard traffic stop. Officer Brad Miller was known for his aggressive tactics, particularly toward black men driving through wealthier parts of town. To him, Marcus was just another suspicious figure who didn't belong. Without even glancing at the license, Miller leaned closer to the window, his flashlight glaring into Marcus's eyes. What are you doing in this neighborhood? He asked, his voice laced with suspicion and disdain. Marcus, keeping his composure, calmly explained that he was heading to visit a friend in the area. The officer's eyes narrowed. A friend, huh? In a car like this? He said, looking over the beat-up sedan Marcus had chosen for its low profile. To Miller, this didn't add up. He had made up his mind. Marcus was up to no good. I'm going to need you to step out of the vehicle, Miller ordered, placing his hand on his holster. The tension in the air was thick. Marcus hesitated for a moment, considering whether to reveal his identity, but he chose not to. He had always believed that his title shouldn't protect him from what ordinary people face daily. And this, he realized, was something far too many black men experienced. As Marcus stepped out of the car, Miller's attitude only grew worse. He began to roughly search Marcus, pushing him against the car without explanation. People passing by slowed down, some stopping to film the incident on their phones. Marcus felt the heat of embarrassment and frustration rise in him, but he remained calm, knowing that any resistance would only escalate the situation. With his hands splayed against the car, Marcus felt the weight of the officer's aggression. Miller's hands moved roughly over Marcus's body, searching for something, anything, that could justify the stop. What's this? Miller sneered as he yanked Marcus's wallet from his pocket, flipping through it carelessly. He didn't notice the senator's ID tucked behind his credit cards, nor did he seem to care. The crowd of onlookers grew, murmuring in disbelief as they watched the scene unfold. Some began recording with their phones, capturing the aggression of the officer and the dignified composure of Marcus. To the bystanders, Marcus was just another black man being unfairly targeted by the police, another victim of racial profiling in a long line of similar incidents. The fact that he was a senator was unknown to everyone present. Where are you hiding the drugs? Miller asked loudly, causing more people to turn their heads. His voice was full of mockery, as if he was performing for the growing audience. Marcus felt the sting of humiliation, but remained silent. He knew there was nothing he could say to change the officer's mindset. Miller was determined to degrade him, regardless of who he truly was. As Miller continued to search, Marcus could hear the whispers from the crowd. This is wrong, someone muttered. Another voice shouted, he didn't do anything. Despite the public outcry, the officer didn't stop. For Marcus, the moment seemed to stretch into eternity. He was a man used to commanding rooms filled with senators, but here he was, powerless in the face of an officer who saw him as nothing more than a threat. 
The video of the incident was uploaded within minutes. Bystanders, shocked by what they had witnessed, shared it across social media platforms, outraged by the treatment of the black man in the video. Marcus's face, though partially obscured in the dim light, was visible enough for the online community to rally behind him. No one knew yet that the man in the video was a U.S. senator. As the video spread, the narrative began to take shape. Another black man, another case of police abuse. Activists, influencers, and journalists picked up the story, calling for justice and accountability. The hashtag started trending, and the incident was quickly becoming a national discussion. Yet still, Marcus remained silent about his identity, watching from the sidelines as the world reacted to his humiliation. In his private world, Marcus debated what to do. He had built a career on being a voice for the voiceless, but now he was one of those silenced by a system that saw him only as a threat. He knew that revealing his identity would change the conversation instantly. The media would shift focus from the injustice faced by many to the shock of a senator being targeted. Marcus didn't want that. He wanted the story to remain about the abuse of power, not his status. Despite his reluctance, the story kept growing. Reporters began to dig deeper into the incident, and soon, someone recognized Marcus in the video. The narrative was about to shift, and there was nothing Marcus could do to stop it. The secret he had kept for the sake of the bigger picture was about to come out, and the impact would be far greater than he ever imagined. The moment the world realized the man in the video was Senator Marcus Davis, the media frenzy intensified. News outlets from coast to coast ran the story, their headlines blazing with the shocking revelation. Senator humiliated in police stop, victim of racial profiling. The focus of the narrative shifted from just another instance of police abuse to the shocking treatment of a high-ranking government official. The nation was in disbelief. How could this have happened? A senator, one of the most powerful voices in Washington, reduced to a figure of public humiliation at the hands of an arrogant officer. As the video continued to circulate, so did the outrage. This wasn't just a case of racial profiling anymore. It was a political scandal. Officer Brad Miller, still unaware of the gravity of his actions, became the center of national outrage. Reporters swarmed his precinct, demanding answers. But the officer remained defiant still believing that his actions were justified. It wasn't until his superior officers informed him of who Marcus truly was that the full weight of his mistake began to sink in. For Marcus, the reveal was a double-edged sword. On one hand, his identity brought the issue of police brutality into sharper focus for those who had previously dismissed it. On the other hand, he feared that his personal story would overshadow the broader issue. Marcus knew that many others faced the same treatment he had, but without the platform or influence to bring about change. Now, he had to decide how to use this moment of exposure to create real, lasting reform. As the story spread across the nation, people from all walks of life expressed their outrage. Civil rights organizations, politicians, and public figures spoke out, condemning the officer's actions and calling for accountability. What had begun as a local incident had now become a national conversation about race, power, and the abuse of authority. Protests erupted in cities across the country. People carried signs demanding justice for Marcus Davis and for all the unnamed victims of police violence. Social media was flooded with messages of support for the senator, with many urging him to take action not only for himself, but for the broader cause of police reform. The public saw Marcus as more than a senator now. He was a symbol of the fight for justice. The pressure on the police department intensified. Calls for Officer Miller's immediate dismissal echoed from all corners, and the mayor's office faced growing demands to launch an independent investigation into the incident. The department, already under scrutiny for previous allegations of racial profiling, was struggling to manage the fallout. Miller's actions had ignited a firestorm and the city was now at the center of a national reckoning. But while the public outcry grew louder, Marcus remained silent. He watched the news reports and read the articles, feeling the weight of expectation pressing down on him. He knew that his voice could push the movement forward, but he also understood that this wasn't just about him. It was about the countless men and women who didn't have the platform he had. Now, 
More than ever, Marcus had to be strategic about his next move. As the nation demanded accountability, Officer Brad Miller remained defiant. In a hastily arranged press conference, Miller's lawyer stood by his side, defending his actions as part of standard police procedure. My client acted in accordance with protocol, the lawyer stated, his voice steady despite the barrage of questions from reporters. This was not about race. This was about ensuring the safety of the community. Miller, standing stiffly beside his lawyer, nodded but avoided eye contact with the cameras. He was in survival mode now, trying to protect his career and reputation. To him, Marcus Davis was just another man who didn't comply quickly enough. And the fact that Marcus was a senator didn't change the legitimacy of his actions, or so he believed. In his mind, the backlash was simply political. But the public wasn't buying it. Social media erupted with reactions to Miller's defense, many pointing out the obvious racial bias in his actions. How many times have we heard this excuse? One post read. When will officers be held accountable for their abuse of power? Another viral tweet declared, This wasn't about protocol. This was about power, and Miller abused it. Despite the mounting criticism, Miller's supporters, though fewer in number, stood behind him. They believed he was being unfairly vilified for doing his job. The media, in their eyes, was blowing the situation out of proportion because of Marcus's political status. But with every passing day, the cracks in Miller's defense were growing larger, and the call for justice was becoming impossible to ignore. While Officer Miller's legal team scrambled to build a defense, the power of the public's voice continued to grow. Marcus watched as the movement demanding police accountability gained momentum, with his face becoming the symbol of a much larger cause. Activists organized rallies across major cities, drawing thousands of people to the streets in a show of unity against racial injustice. Protesters carried signs with messages like, Justice for Marcus, and end police brutality. The movement was no longer just about one man. It was about systemic change. The streets filled with people of all races and backgrounds, united in their call for an overhaul of the justice system. From Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, the country seemed to be waking up to the reality that Marcus had known for years. For Marcus, the outpouring of support was overwhelming. He had always been a public figure, but never had he experienced this level of attention. His office was flooded with calls and emails, many from people sharing their own stories of police mistreatment. Marcus knew that his situation was unique only because of his status. The stories pouring in revealed just how common his experience was for black men and women across the country. As Marcus prepared to speak publicly for the first time since the incident, he reflected on the power of the people. This wasn't just about his case anymore. It was about creating lasting change. He could feel the weight of responsibility settling on his shoulders. The public had made their voices heard, and now it was time for him to speak. A week after the incident, Marcus finally broke his silence. Standing at a podium in front of a sea of reporters, cameras flashing and microphones poised, Marcus looked out over the crowd with a steady gaze. His hands gripped the edges of the podium, not from nervousness, but from the gravity of the moment. This wasn't just about him. This was about every person who had been wronged by a system designed to protect them. Thank you for being here, Marcus began, his voice calm but firm. This past week has been overwhelming, not just for me, but for so many others whose voices have gone unheard for far too long. He paused, letting the weight of his words sink in. What happened to me was not an isolated incident. It's part of a much larger issue that we can no longer ignore, an issue that goes beyond titles beyond positions of power. It's about human dignity. Marcus's words were measured, but they carried the force of years of frustration. He had spent his political career advocating for those who couldn't speak for themselves, but now he found himself in their shoes. He spoke about the need for police reform, for holding officers accountable, and for reimagining a system that worked for everyone, not just the privileged few. I'm here today not as a senator, but as a man who experienced firsthand what so many others have gone through in silence, he said, his voice growing stronger. And I promise you this, I will use every ounce of my power, every resource at my disposal to ensure that this never happens again. Not to me, 
not to anyone. The crowd erupted in applause, and for the first time since the incident, Marcus felt a sense of hope. In the days following Marcus's powerful speech, the call for reform reached new heights. Citizens, activists, and politicians from both sides of the aisle rallied behind the senator's message. What had begun as a local police incident had now become a national conversation about systemic injustice. The country was demanding change, and Marcus was at the forefront of the movement. Politicians who had once been silent on the issue of police reform now found themselves forced to take a stance. Marcus's colleagues in the Senate reached out to offer their support, and soon, a bipartisan bill aimed at addressing police accountability was in the works. Marcus had long advocated for this kind of legislation, but now, with the full force of public opinion behind him, it seemed possible for the first time. The bill proposed sweeping reforms, including mandatory body cameras, independent investigations into police misconduct, and the creation of a national database to track officers with histories of excessive force. Marcus worked tirelessly with his colleagues to draft the legislation, using his platform to push for change at every opportunity. He knew that real reform wouldn't happen overnight, but this was the first step in a long journey. As the bill gained traction, Marcus felt a renewed sense of purpose. The incident that had humiliated him had also ignited a movement, and now he had the chance to turn that moment of pain into lasting progress. The public was demanding change, and Marcus was determined to deliver it. Subscribe to stay updated on how Marcus's fight for justice continues, and to follow his journey toward meaningful reform. As momentum for the police reform bill grew, so did the resistance from those who benefited from the status quo. Law enforcement unions, conservative politicians, and lobbyists who had long profited from maintaining the current system began to push back against Marcus's efforts. They labeled the bill as anti-police and argued that it would make officers hesitant to do their jobs, putting public safety at risk. Marcus knew that this opposition would come, but the intensity of the pushback still caught him off guard. His office was inundated with hate mail, and he received anonymous threats warning him to back down. Conservative news outlets painted him as a radical intent on dismantling law enforcement, using his own experience as an excuse to pass extreme legislation. Despite the criticism, Marcus stood firm. He had faced political resistance before, but this felt different. The people who opposed the bill weren't just defending their careers. They were defending a system that had been deeply ingrained in American society for centuries. They feared the power shift that would occur if Marcus's reform succeeded. Still, Marcus was prepared for a fight. He knew that real change wouldn't come without facing powerful opposition. He rallied his supporters, reminding them that the bill was about accountability, not attacking law enforcement. He framed it as a necessary step toward restoring public trust in the police. And while the battle ahead would be difficult, Marcus had the backing of the public and a growing number of political allies ready to fight alongside him. Back in the city where the incident had taken place, tensions were running high. Protests had grown larger and more frequent, with demonstrators demanding not only justice for Marcus, but also an overhaul of the local police force. The mayor and police chief found themselves under intense scrutiny, accused of allowing a culture of impunity to fester within the department. The streets were filled with signs and chants as people marched for reform. Justice for Marcus and end police brutality were the rallying cries heard from City Hall to the governor's office. Meanwhile, local businesses shuttered their windows, fearing that the unrest might spiral into something more destructive. Police in riot gear patrolled the streets, their presence only adding to the tension. Behind the scenes, Marcus was in contact with local officials, urging them to address the situation before it escalated further. He had no interest in seeing violence erupt in his name. Instead, he wanted to use the momentum of the protest to push for meaningful dialogue and change. But the city's leaders were hesitant, caught between appeasing the police and responding to the growing demands for reform. The situation in the city mirrored the larger national conversation. People were fed up with years of injustice, and the pressure was building. Marcus could feel that this was a pivotal moment, one that could either lead to real change or further division. He knew that how he responded in the coming days would be critical 
not just for his political future, but for the movement itself. Under increasing pressure, the police department finally issued a public statement regarding the incident. The police chief, standing before a room of reporters and flashing cameras, expressed regret over the events that had transpired but stopped short of taking responsibility. We understand the concerns raised by the community, the chief said. However, Officer Miller was following protocol, and we will conduct a thorough internal review. The response did little to quell the growing unrest. The public wanted more than a review. They wanted accountability. Protests outside the police station intensified, with demonstrators demanding Officer Miller's firing and a broader investigation into the department's practices. The statement from the police chief, seen as a weak attempt to avoid blame, only fueled the anger of those calling for reform. Meanwhile, Officer Miller himself had gone silent. His public appearances were canceled, and rumors swirled that he was under pressure from his superiors to resign quietly. But Marcus knew that Miller was only one part of the problem. Firing one officer wouldn't fix the systemic issues within the police force. He wanted a complete overhaul of how policing was conducted, not just in his city, but nationwide. The tepid response from the police department only reinforced Marcus's belief that real change had to come from the top down. He knew that the internal review would likely lead nowhere unless there was external pressure. With the national spotlight still on him, Marcus vowed to continue using his platform to demand justice, regardless of how uncomfortable it made those in power. As Marcus's push for police reform gained traction, the threats against him grew more serious. Anonymous letters were sent to his office, filled with hateful language and warnings to stop stirring trouble. One evening, as Marcus returned to his home, he noticed a black SUV idling across the street. The car had been there for several nights in a row, and each time it left as soon as Marcus approached. His security detail, reinstated after the incident, urged him to take the threats seriously. They're not just angry words, one of his bodyguards warned. These people want to scare you into silence. Marcus knew they were right, but he refused to back down. He had come too far to be intimidated now. Still, the constant presence of threats began to weigh on him. Sarah, his chief of staff, pushed him to increase his security and avoid public appearances, but Marcus refused. If I hide, they win, he told her. This isn't just about me. It's about every person who has been silenced by fear. Despite his outward confidence, Marcus knew that the stakes were higher than ever. The people he was challenging had power, influence, and the means to make his life difficult. As the threats continued to escalate, Marcus remained resolute. He would not be silenced by fear, but he also knew that he needed to be smart. The people behind these threats weren't just angry citizens. They were part of the system he was trying to dismantle. The deeper Marcus went into this fight, the more dangerous it became, but he was ready to face whatever came next. As the threats intensified, so did the support for Marcus. Fellow senators, civil rights leaders, and activists from across the country began to rally behind him, publicly endorsing his police reform bill and calling for urgent action. High-profile figures took to social media to express their solidarity, with hashtags like Nation Stand with Marcus and Reform Now trending nationwide. In Washington, Marcus found unexpected allies from across the political spectrum. Even some conservative lawmakers, who had previously been resistant to police reform, acknowledged the need for change. They were moved by Marcus's personal experience and the national outcry that followed. While they didn't agree on everything, they recognized that the status quo could no longer be defended. Among Marcus's supporters was Senator Rachel Collins, a progressive leader who had long been a champion of criminal justice reform. She and Marcus formed a powerful alliance, working together to draft additional provisions to strengthen the police reform bill. Their partnership sent a clear message. The fight for justice was gaining momentum, and it wasn't just one man's battle, it was a movement. With each new endorsement, Marcus's resolve grew stronger. The voices of support drowned out the threats, and the movement for reform gained momentum that was impossible to ignore. Marcus knew that they were approaching a turning point. The pressure on lawmakers to pass meaningful reform was mounting, and for the first time, real change felt within reach. 
Subscribe to the channel to follow Marcus's fight for justice and see how his reform movement continues to grow. As the internal investigation into Officer Miller's conduct continued, the pressure for accountability mounted. Protesters outside the police station demanded action, and Marcus's public statements only increased the scrutiny on the department. Under the weight of public pressure, the district attorney's office announced that Miller would face charges for his actions during the traffic stop. The arrest of Officer Miller was a significant victory for Marcus and his supporters, but it was also a bittersweet moment. While the officer's arrest signaled that the system could be held accountable, it also reminded Marcus that justice wasn't always swift. It had taken weeks of public outcry, protests, and media attention to get to this point. Without the video footage and Marcus's status, Miller might never have been held accountable. Miller's arrest sparked renewed debate about police accountability. Some hailed it as a sign that the system was working, while others argued that it was merely a symbolic gesture. Marcus, for his part, saw it as a step in the right direction, but he knew that the arrest of one officer wasn't enough. The fight for systemic reform continued, and Marcus remained focused on the bigger picture. As Miller was led away in handcuffs, news cameras captured the moment, broadcasting it to millions of viewers. The image of the once defiant officer being held accountable for his actions sent a powerful message. But Marcus knew that this was just the beginning. The real work of changing the system was still ahead. As the police reform bill gained momentum in Congress, Marcus was called to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. The hearing, broadcast live across the country, was a pivotal moment in the fight for reform. Marcus knew that this was his chance to make the case for why the bill was necessary and to push back against the powerful forces working to undermine it. The hearing room was packed with senators, reporters, and activists, all eager to hear Marcus's testimony. As he sat before the committee, he felt the weight of the moment. This wasn't just about him anymore. It was about the countless lives that had been affected by police violence and the broken system that allowed it to continue. Senator Davis, the committee chair. Senator Davis, the committee chair began, his voice echoing through the packed hearing room. Your experience has highlighted the urgent need for police reform. We've read your proposal, but we want to hear from you directly. Why is this legislation so critical for the future of law enforcement in our country? Marcus took a deep breath, glancing briefly at the faces of the senators seated before him. The stakes were high, and he knew this testimony could either solidify the momentum for reform or allow the opposition to find cracks in his argument. He leaned into the microphone, his voice steady and clear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Marcus began. What happened to me could have happened to anyone. I am here not because of my title, but because the system that should protect all citizens failed me, as it has failed so many others. This bill isn't about attacking law enforcement. It's about restoring trust between the police and the communities they serve. It's about accountability, transparency, and ensuring that no one is above the law. His words resonated throughout the room. Reporters scribbled furiously, and the senators leaned in, listening intently. Marcus outlined the key components of the bill, mandatory body cameras, independent oversight boards, and stricter penalties for officers who abuse their power. He emphasized that this legislation wasn't just about punishing bad cops. It was about ensuring that good officers had the tools they needed to do their jobs with integrity. As Marcus finished his testimony, there was a brief silence in the room, followed by murmurs of approval. It was clear that his words had left an impact. Now, it was up to the committee to decide whether they would stand on the right side of history or continue to allow the system to operate unchecked. While Marcus's testimony was well-received by many, the opposition within the Senate began to rally against the police reform bill. Some conservative senators, backed by powerful law enforcement unions, argued that the bill went too far, accusing Marcus of using his personal experience to push a radical agenda. They framed the bill as an attack on the brave men and women in uniform who risked their lives to keep the public safe. In a heated debate on the Senate floor, Senator James Holt, a vocal critic of the bill, stood to deliver his rebuttal. Senator Davis's experience is unfortunate, Holt began, but we cannot allow one incident to dictate national policy. This bill will handcuff our police officers, 
making it harder for them to protect us from crime. It's misguided and dangerous. The words stung, but Marcus remained composed as he listened. He knew the real issue wasn't about safety. It was about maintaining a system that protected those in power. The opposition was using fear to justify the continuation of unchecked authority. But Marcus had come prepared for this fight. He had seen the data, heard the stories of countless victims, and knew that reform wasn't just necessary. It was inevitable. In response to Senator Holt's speech, Marcus took the floor once again, calmly dismantling the argument. This bill isn't about one incident, Marcus said. It's about hundreds, thousands of incidents across the country that we have turned a blind eye to for too long. Our police officers should be empowered by the truth, not protected by the lies we've allowed to continue. The debate raged on, but it was clear that Marcus had the upper hand. Public opinion was on his side, and even those in the Senate who were hesitant to support the bill knew they could no longer ignore the call for reform. As the Senate debate intensified, the public continued to put pressure on lawmakers to pass Marcus's police reform bill. Protests outside the Capitol grew in size, with activists, community leaders, and everyday citizens demanding that their voices be heard. Signs reading, Pass the Bill Now and Accountability for All, filled the streets as people marched for change. Social media became a battleground of its own, with millions of users calling on their senators to support the bill. Hashtags like Reform or Resign and Justice now trended for days as influencers, celebrities, and activists used their platforms to amplify the message. The national conversation had shifted, and the demand for police reform was louder than ever before. Even corporations and business leaders began to speak out in favor of the bill, recognizing that the tide was turning. They issued statements calling for lawmakers to act swiftly and decisively. The pressure was mounting, and senators who had once been on the fence about the bill found themselves in the uncomfortable position of having to choose between the status quo and the future. Marcus watched in awe as the movement he had helped spark took on a life of its own. He knew this was no longer just about him. It was about the people. The public's outcry had reached a fever pitch, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the Senate couldn't ignore the will of the people much longer. Despite the public's overwhelming support for the bill, Marcus knew that the real battle was happening behind closed doors. In private meetings and phone calls, senators were being lobbied hard by law enforcement unions and special interest groups who opposed the reforms. Deals were being made, promises exchanged, and compromises considered, all in an effort to water down the bill's key provisions. Marcus and his team worked tirelessly to push back against these efforts. He met with senators from both parties, urging them to stand firm and resist the pressure to weaken the bill. He reminded them of the responsibility they had to the people they served and the historic opportunity before them to make meaningful change. Sarah, Marcus's chief of staff, kept a close eye on the negotiations, ensuring that no vital components of the bill were sacrificed in the name of political expediency. They're going to try to gut it, she warned one evening as they reviewed the latest draft. We have to hold the line. In those late-night strategy meetings, Marcus and his team carefully planned their next moves. They reached out to key allies, rallying support from civil rights groups and advocacy organizations. Marcus knew that if the bill passed in a watered-down form, it would be a hollow victory. The stakes were too high to settle for less than true reform. As the final negotiations dragged on, Marcus remained vigilant. He wasn't going to let this moment slip away. The country was watching and history would remember how this battle for justice was fought and won. The day of the Senate vote was fast approaching, and the tension in Washington was palpable. Both sides of the debate had mobilized their forces, and the outcome remained uncertain. Marcus knew that the bill's passage hinged on a few key swing votes, and he spent the final days leading up to the vote, working the phones, meeting with senators, and making his case one last time. The opposition, meanwhile, was working just as hard to defeat the bill. Senators who had long been loyal to the status quo were under immense pressure from powerful interest groups to vote against the reforms. The battle lines were drawn, and the stakes couldn't have been higher. 
In the days leading up to the vote, Marcus's team launched a final media blitz, urging citizens to call their senators and demand that they vote in favor of the bill. Public opinion was still overwhelmingly on their side, but Marcus knew that politics could be unpredictable. The final outcome was anything but certain. On the night before the vote, Marcus stood outside the Capitol building, looking out over the city. The lights of Washington flickered in the distance, and he felt the weight of the moment pressing down on him. This was the culmination of everything he had fought for. Tomorrow, they would either make history or fall short of the change the country so desperately needed. Subscribe now to stay updated on the final vote and to see how Marcus's battle for justice unfolds. The morning of the vote dawned with a sense of anticipation and uncertainty. The halls of the Capitol were buzzing with activity as senators arrived, reporters swarmed, and activists filled the streets outside. Marcus walked into the Senate chamber with his head held high, knowing that no matter the outcome, he had done everything in his power to fight for justice. The debate on the Senate floor was fierce. Supporters of the bill made impassioned speeches, emphasizing the need for accountability and reform in law enforcement. Marcus, watching from his seat, listened as his colleagues spoke, grateful for the allies who had stood by him throughout this long battle. The opposition, however, was just as vocal. Senators who opposed the bill argued that it went too far, that it would tie the hands of law enforcement and lead to increased crime. Marcus felt a pang of frustration as he listened to their arguments, knowing that fear-mongering had long been a tactic used to maintain the status quo. As the final speeches concluded and the vote was called, the chamber fell silent. Marcus held his breath as the votes were tallied, his heart pounding in his chest. This was the moment they had all been waiting for. The future of police reform, and perhaps even his political career, hung in the balance. The votes were in. The room was tense, the air thick with anticipation. Marcus held his breath, waiting for the final count. And then it happened. The bill passed by a narrow margin. A collective gasp rippled through the Senate chamber, followed by an eruption of applause from the supporters of the reform. Marcus felt a wave of relief wash over him. The fight had been long and grueling, but they had won. The police reform bill was now law, and the changes he had fought so hard for would finally begin to take shape. He stood from his seat, his heart racing as he shook hands with his colleagues who had supported him through this journey. Outside the Capitol, the crowd of protesters erupted into cheers as news of the bill's passage spread. People danced in the streets, hugged one another, and chanted for justice. It was a moment of celebration, not just for Marcus, but for all the activists, citizens, and leaders who had worked tirelessly to make this moment possible. As Marcus walked out of the Senate chamber, he felt a sense of pride and accomplishment unlike anything he had ever experienced. This was more than just a political victory, it was a victory for the people. But even as the celebrations began, Marcus knew that the real work was just beginning. That evening, after the bill had passed and the celebrations had quieted down, Marcus found himself alone in his office, reflecting on the journey that had brought him to this moment. The traffic stop that had humiliated him had sparked a national movement, and now meaningful change was finally within reach. He thought about the countless people who had been affected by police violence and injustice, many of whom didn't have the platform or the privilege that he had. Marcus knew that while the passage of the bill was a significant step forward, it wasn't the end of the fight. There were still so many battles left to be fought, so many lives still in danger from the systemic failures that had plagued the country for so long. As he stared out the window at the city below, Marcus felt a renewed sense of purpose. This was just the beginning. He had used his voice and his platform to make a difference, but there was still so much more to do. He knew that the fight for justice was never truly over. It was a constant battle, and he was ready to continue that fight for as long as it took. The evening air was cool, and the city lights twinkled in the distance. Marcus took a deep breath, feeling both exhausted and invigorated. He had made history, but the future still held so many unknowns. Tomorrow, the real work would begin. Subscribe to the channel to follow Marcus's journey as he continues the fight for justice and leads the way toward lasting reform.
With the police reform bill officially signed into law, the work of implementing its provisions began. Marcus wasted no time in overseeing the next steps, working closely with law enforcement agencies, civil rights groups, and local governments to ensure that the reforms were enacted properly and efficiently. With the police reform bill officially signed into law, the real work of implementation began. Marcus, though exhausted from the battle in the Senate, took on a new role, overseeing the rollout of the reforms across the nation. He collaborated closely with police departments, civil rights organizations, and city leaders to ensure that the changes weren't just symbolic, but deeply impactful. Police departments in major cities began adopting the new measures, installing mandatory body cameras, establishing independent oversight boards, and retraining officers on how to engage with their communities. Marcus traveled across the country, meeting with police chiefs and community leaders to ensure that the reforms were implemented with integrity. But it wasn't without resistance. In some regions, officers and their unions pushed back, claiming that the new measures would make their jobs harder and more dangerous. Some police departments resisted the changes, citing budget constraints or logistical challenges. Marcus knew that the fight wasn't over. He continued to push, reminding them that these reforms were about building trust between law enforcement and the people they were sworn to protect. Despite the challenges, the public's response remained overwhelmingly positive. Marcus saw firsthand the impact of the reforms in communities that had long been distrustful of the police. People began to believe that change was possible and the relationship between law enforcement and civilians slowly started to heal. Don't miss the latest updates on how these historic reforms are being implemented. Subscribe to the channel to follow Marcus's journey. As Marcus traveled across the country, helping cities and states adopt the reforms, he encountered unexpected resistance from within. Some city officials, particularly in regions with strong law enforcement unions, quietly delayed the implementation of the new measures. They claimed that the reforms were too costly, too complex, or that they would harm police morale. In one tense meeting with the mayor of a major city, Marcus was confronted with a wall of opposition. Senator, the mayor said, leaning across the table, we're trying our best, but these reforms just aren't practical for our department right now. We need more time. The mayor's words were polite, but Marcus could see the hesitation in his eyes. The political pressure from the police unions was clear. Marcus knew this battle wouldn't be won easily. He reminded the mayor and others like him that the people were watching. These reforms weren't optional. They were necessary to rebuild trust and ensure accountability. If we don't implement these changes now, Marcus said firmly, we risk falling back into the same patterns of abuse and neglect. The pushback frustrated Marcus, but it also strengthened his resolve. He had come too far to allow the reforms to be delayed or diluted. The people had fought for this, and Marcus knew he had to keep fighting too. Even if that meant going up against powerful local forces, he wasn't going to back down. Amidst the challenges, there were also stories of hope that reminded Marcus why this fight was so important. In one city, a police department that had fully embraced the reforms saw a dramatic shift in how officers interacted with the community. Incidents of excessive force dropped significantly, and community policing programs flourished. Marcus visited this city, meeting with both officers and residents. He saw firsthand the change in attitudes. Officers who once saw citizens as potential threats now viewed them as partners in keeping the community safe. In a community forum, an elderly black woman stood up and addressed the room. For the first time in my life, she said, her voice shaking with emotion, I feel like the police are here for me, not against me. Her words hit Marcus hard. This was exactly why he had fought so hard for these reforms. Seeing the direct impact on people's lives reminded him that the work was worth it, even in the face of opposition. The reforms weren't just changing policies, they were changing hearts and minds. Marcus shared the story of this city with lawmakers and other police departments, using it as proof that reform was possible and effective. It wasn't about weakening the police, it was about making them better, more trusted, and more respected by the communities they served. Stories like these are what keep Marcus going. Subscribe to the channel to hear more inspiring stories of change and hope 
from across the nation. The fight for reform had taken a personal toll on Marcus. His once private life was now constantly under public scrutiny. The threats against him had not subsided, and his family was feeling the strain of his high-profile position. His wife, Emily, had stood by him through it all, but the weight of his work was beginning to affect their home life. One evening, after a particularly long day of meetings and public appearances, Marcus returned home to find Emily sitting quietly in their living room, the weight of her own exhaustion clear on her face. You're always fighting, she said softly, and I support you, but we miss you. The kids miss you. Her words struck Marcus like a blow. He sat down beside her, the realization of what his work had cost him settling in. He had spent so much time fighting for others that he had neglected the ones closest to him. Marcus knew that the fight was important, but he also knew that he couldn't afford to lose his family in the process. That night, Marcus made a promise to himself and to Emily. He would find a balance. The work was far from over, but he needed to be present for his family too. He had to find a way to fight for justice without sacrificing the people he loved most. With the reforms taking root in cities across the country, Marcus turned his attention to the bigger picture, national reform. The bill he had fought so hard to pass was only the beginning. There were still systemic issues in the criminal justice system that needed to be addressed, issues that went beyond policing. Marcus began working with legal experts and civil rights advocates to draft new legislation that would tackle mass incarceration, racial disparities in sentencing, and the need for restorative justice programs. He knew that true reform required a holistic approach, one that looked at every aspect of the system, not just law enforcement. As he prepared to introduce this new legislation, Marcus reflected on how far they had come. The police reform bill had been a monumental victory, but the journey was far from over. The country was ready for deeper change, and Marcus was determined to be the one to lead that charge. He knew that the road ahead would be difficult, but he had seen what was possible when people came together to demand justice. The momentum was on their side, and Marcus believed that this was their moment to create lasting, transformative change. Don't miss the next chapter in Marcus's fight for justice. Subscribe to the channel to follow his push for national reform. As the years passed, Marcus's work in the Senate left a lasting legacy. The reforms he had fought for became the foundation for a new era of accountability and fairness in law enforcement. Communities that had once been divided by fear and mistrust now worked together with their local police departments to create safer, more just environments. But Marcus's legacy wasn't just about the laws he helped pass. It was about the movement he had inspired. People across the country had found their voices, standing up to demand justice and equality. His story had shown that one person's fight for dignity and fairness could ignite a nationwide call for change. In his final days in office, Marcus reflected on the journey that had begun with a humiliating traffic stop and had ended with a national movement for justice. He knew that the fight was never truly over. There would always be challenges, always more work to be done. But he felt a deep sense of pride in knowing that he had played a part in making the country a better place. As he prepared to leave the Senate and return to his private life, Marcus made a final promise to himself. He would never stop fighting for justice, no matter where life took him. His legacy would live on in the laws he had helped create, in the lives he had touched, and in the countless people who had been inspired to carry the torch forward. Subscribe to the channel to continue following Marcus's journey and to learn more about the lasting impact of his work for justice and reform.